the, the most interesting aspect of the research was to be able to see the manuscript in Helsinki and see on the paper the differences. Um, I had my white gloves and uh, uh, I opened it and it was such a wonderful experience. First of all, the, the, the manuscript had a lot of drawings. Um, Sibelius was drawing uh, pine trees, birds, uh, uh, a sunset uh, in some places, some passages. Uh, so you 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 kind of enter his head and the the mindset he had at that time, or he would suddenly uh, take the pen, the pencil, and uh, and scratch all this passage. And uh, trying, I was trying to see what was behind. Uh, Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. I'm joined by my colleague in Canada's National Art Centre Orchestra, violinist Frédéric Moisan. Originally from the Breton town of Saint-Brieuc in France, he immigrated to Finland and then Canada. In this wide-ranging conversation, we talked about windsurfing, family, languages, different cultures' approaches to education, the challenges of playing the violin, the original version of the Sibelius Violin Concerto, which was the subject of Fred's doctoral dissertation, life balance, and fly fishing. We talked about the differences between being a freelancer to being an orchestra member. Fred has great advice for colleagues and students preparing auditions, and you can find these various topics in the timestamps. Like all my episodes, this is available as both a video on my YouTube and a podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. The transcript is linked on my website to the episode. Finally, do check out the link to my Ko-fi page in the description, since I really need my listeners' support to keep this project going. Hi, Fred. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Leah. Very nice to, to be here. Thank you. So you grew up in Brittany. Yeah. And... I was researching, I think you've told me a little bit about it, but it seems like the Newfoundland of France. It's cold, it's windy, it rains all the time, very cold ocean. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny you say that because there is a link between Newfoundland and Brittany. Mm -hmm. As many fishermen went to get, uh, how do you call that? La Morue, I think it's cod. Cod, right? yeah. Cod, yeah. Um, fishermen from Brittany went there. It was in terrible conditions, you can mm. imagine at that time. But uh, yeah, so there is definitely a link in that, and also probably with the weather. Even if it's it's milder, of course, in Brittany. But mm -hmm. yeah, but these big cliffs. Uh, yeah, when when we went there with the orchestra, I, w I was very surprised also that there are some similarities in the in the in the in, the, in these big cliffs actually. Yeah, and the sea and the you know it's we have a lot of storm in Brittany. Of course, coming from the Atlantic, directly from Ireland, and and then hitting hitting France right there, so it's it's beautiful actually when you see the sea in these conditions. Mm -hmm. Love it. I miss it. I miss it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's been hard with the pandemic, particularly for travel. Yeah. Right. Right. But I've been lucky. We we went to Finland uh, last summer. We had two, and yeah. uh, no, no, it was great to be able to, to go back again, yeah. So what was it like for you when you grew up in Brittany and you did a lot of studies there and then you had gone to Paris? Yeah, well, it's been, it's been something. Uh, I, I've been studying in, uh, in Brittany for 17, 18 years, 17 years, I think. And then um, I took some, uh, some lessons from a teacher in Paris um, and I went back and forth and... Uh, she also came okay. uh, quite often, and um, and then I went to uh, to Nantes. That was uh, for two years. I had the, the privilege to be part of. Uh, it, it was called the, you know, how French can put names like that. It's a Formation Supérieure au Métier d'Instrumentiste à Corde d'Orchestre, um, and that was a huge acronym, and uh, I don't remember it. But um, yeah, basically two years of um, learning how to play in an orchestra with uh, concert masters from all around France and also conductors from all around France. It's it's a little bit like the um, Orchestre des Jeunes de, de France, mm -hmm. uh, and but it's it's very um, much more focused on the on the string playing actually. Even we played symphonies, it was it was very much. Uh, 
uh, into that. So it, it was a great, great uh, period. I loved it. We had Pascal Vero, uh, Rofe, and all these great conductors coming. And uh, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, so I'm curious, do you think they set up this institute because they felt there was a need for string yeah. players to learn how to play an orchestra because the focus is more on solo playing and conservatoire? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's that's missing missing in the education totally. Um, basically, you just play concerto and uh, a concerto uh, showpiece and uh, even sonatas. Uh, I was... You know, the the first big sonata that I pl- I played was in Finland. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I know. Well, I played some you know small small ones, but I mean not small ones, but you know what I mean. Uh, but yeah, there there was there was cl- clearly a need uh, to open this, and it's it's still on, and uh, and actually there are, there are different now d- different ones uh, in Lyon, in Paris, in Nantes. Yeah. Okay. Super interesting. It was um, short sessions of uh, three, four days. Um, what was it? Once per two weeks or something like that. So I, I was based in Nantes because of that. And I was also in the um, uh, that Cours Supérieur in conservatory, like when you graduate in, in, the, in France and conservatory, then you have the option to continue study your studies. Okay. And uh, no. Is there, because of the conservatoire system there, are people going to university to study music or not so much? No. I, I mean, it's, it's the performance studies are not in university. Okay. I know now there is a, a statue for, even when I was, uh, I was a student in a in conservatory, I didn't have a student statue. So I couldn't go to, uh, you know, the restaurant universitaire or having all these advantages you have oh. as a student. Yeah, but it changed. Uh, okay. I was I was away already, but it changed. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's very academical for, for university. And I used to actually go to a musicology just because of that, because I needed a statue. And um, <clears throat> my parents wanted me to apply in, you know, law or medicine. Of course, I was not interested into that. Um, I just wanted to play music, but uh, the only options option was to maybe go in musicology, and I, I did that for two years, but just just enough to keep my statue, and uh, and then left. Yeah, and this this um, uh, sorry I, academy I told you about orchestra academy. I had the statue with that. Sorry, Fred, you mean status, right? Status, sorry. Yeah. No, not a statue. Of course, yes. No, status. Sorry mm-hmm. about that. No, it, it's it's actually, <laughs> um, it's funny. You always agree to speak in French with me at work, which I c- completely appreciate because I never get to practice French really other than speaking with you. So mm-hmm. it's funny to speak English together. So let's go back to um, growing up in Brittany before we leave that. So, because yeah. I know you're very connected with nature and you're used to, search for mushrooms with your dad how did that affect you in terms of balancing your life because when we're serious about violin as a young child it takes so many hours of practice yeah um well first of all in Brittany, i grew up near the sea i was like steps away so i uh, i spent my time in the water uh doing you know surfing sailing windsurfing that was two three four times a week until i was 17 and um you know i told you about this special teacher i had who would it changed um well made me grow up faster in that way that i had to take a decision and also maybe cut in things that were taking a lot of space and that were not good for what i was going to do talking about the violin playing as a career potentially but uh, coming back to the, the Brittany and uh, and this outdoor, it's yeah, it's been part of me since I, I was very young, and uh, I think what I miss the most from Brittany is again, it's again the sea, the open open space, uh, being able to watch from you know you, you can see what's what there, maybe New Finland, <laughs> yeah. and I love that idea, and I miss that a lot. When I went in Finland after that, it's um, it's kind of flat, 
except in, in Lapland. And uh, you have trees everywhere. So basically you, your view stops at the next tree. And it was a little bit overwhelming for me. I felt, you know, a little bit claustrophobic. Claustroph mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, you know, I learned new things. I went skiing, I went, and they have these big lakes also. Uh, there are more lakes than land almost in, uh, in North Carolina. So I found again this uh, feeling of, you know, you can go and you don't see what's next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm sure people will be very interested to hear how on earth you ended up going to Finland from France. Oh, um, when I was about to start this academy in Nantes, um, that was just when I graduated. I was, so I was uh, 17. I got this very pompous uh, grade we have in France called Médaille d'Or, mm -hmm. um, like Olympic Games. It always makes me laugh when I when I went back in um, when I came in Canada and I said um, I had my gold gold medal uh, from France. People were laughing so much. But um, so when I when I got that, uh, I had different choices and I decided to go for for this academy and right at that time arrived um, a wonderful lady um, who was even younger than me so I was you know at yeah ab about that age and uh, and she accepted to uh, uh, to play with me for the audition uh, I remember we she, she barely spoke uh, French she came in France for that as an exchange student and uh, by chance, she played the piano, so I asked her, uh, "Would you would you accept to play with me?" And uh, I have a Mozart concerto to play, a Mendelssohn concerto, and uh, and she said, "Yeah." And um, because of her, I got to the academy and um, did it for two years. Um, and I went back to Finland a year later. And um, because we were together, I had to decide if. Well, what's next after the academy, which was two years, um, and decided to to leave. So I went to my parents and said, I was 20, 21, 20. And I said, uh, well, dad and mom, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going there. <laughs> I didn't have any plan. Well, I had a few ones, but uh, well, my mom was, was shocked. She said, well, you really can't do that. And uh, I ended up applying in Sibelius Academy. Uh, didn't get the audition. It was really a last minute thing. I was not prepared. And, uh, but uh, I wanted to go there and, and join Annie. So uh, she was living in a small, well, it's, not, it's, it's a big city in Finland, but it's very small compared to other countries, of course. Um, there are just five millions. And, uh, uh, but this, this small city, Medium City had all the infrastructure. They have a, an orchestra, they have a, a theater, they have a conservatory, they have everything. There is a university. And uh, by chance, uh, there was a teacher there I, I loved. I, I played for him uh, and uh, I knew right away that, okay, let's go with him. Doesn't matter where this is in, on earth. It's, uh, you know, it's a really random place maybe 100 kilometers from Russia in, uh, in the forest and the lakes. And uh, I had a, also a chamber music teacher who was um, from Netherlands, Hans Loders, a viola player. And uh, he became a very good friend. And um, when I played the audition for, for this place, he said, I've been to Brittany, I've been to Ile de Brea, which is very close to, to my place. And uh, so we had a connection right away. And um, yeah, so I left. I said, okay, mom, uh, I, I have a plan, so let's make it. And, uh, and left. But when you met Annie, I thought she was just going back to Finland. Were you long distance then? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, for, for more than a year. Yeah, for more than a year. And, yeah. and how long did you spend with her when you were falling in love before she had to go back? Mm. Well, not much actually. I think um, <laughs> I don't know if she. <laughs> uh, 
I think it was short. It was short. <laughs> I yeah. think officially two, three weeks. Yeah, and, uh, it's an incredible yeah. story because you're you're together to this day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and when I think now, because we I didn't have uh, we didn't have internet. I mean, I didn't. I, it was really the beginning. I didn't have a, mm -hmm. an email address, for example. She was the first one to open me on a, I think Yahoo, uh, my mm -hmm. first email address, and that was a year after. But for one year and more, we we sent letters by post. Mm -hmm. And um, she managed to come for, I think, Christmas or not, maybe not Christmas, but um, one in the, during the year. And I went there also once. Mm -hmm. And um, it worked. Well, <laughs> today it would be complicated not having internet. I, I don't know how we did, but I, I still have all the letters. And uh, yeah, it's funny. That's wonderful. And so talk about learning Finnish and how that worked for you as being an immigrant there. Okay. Um, well, this, this place is uh, not overwhelmed by immigration. So basically, <laughs> as a French, I was the, the red uh, spot in the city when I was crossing the, the, the marketplace. And you, you get to know almost every, everybody. Uh, I remember going from the conservatory to my place in the street. I, I could, I was able to recognize so many people, which is, you know, you walk in, in the street in Montreal. It's, it's, you can, you can, you can be in the middle of a crowd and uh, and feel very alone. There, that was not the case. And uh, of course, the my English was pretty bad. It's still not good, but it was, it was very bad. So I had no choice to take the easiest way to communicate. So I went for English first. And then uh, Annie was very kind to, to really help me with that. We had, um, she, she, she had, um, how do you call that? This post-it, this small piece, pieces. Flashcards? Yeah, pieces okay. of paper where she wrote every word, like in the kitchen you have, you know, a plate. You have the fridge in, in Finnish, all these names, so I could see them every day and get to learn them. And this uh, chamber music teacher I told you about, Hans Loders from uh, Netherlands, he was married to uh, a Finn also. Mm -hmm. And he just got a baby, Lauri, when I arrived there. Mm -hmm. And when I left, he was a year and a half. Uh, no, 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 wait, wait a second. No, no, he was three years but uh he got to to speak almost fluently at you know a year and a half two years and my finnish was still kind of low but it's it's such a complicated language very complicated i remember driving on the road there and uh, i had the instructions to you know follow the the plan and uh, the map and i had to take one exit and that name was longest that and I didn't have time to read it on the, you know, on the word sign, and uh, I missed yeah. it. But but it's basically, uh, well, the feeling I had for during all the time I was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for people that are younger, I mean, there's no GPS at that time. No, no, so. of course not, of course <laughs> yeah. not. But it's a it's a it's a great language. Uh, it's actually a very rich language. So it's not part of the Indo-European language family. Some people don't realize no, that. No, it's and... it's a it's a Finno-Ugrian language, and uh, after some research, because I felt I'm I'm terrible with that language, I need to find an excuse not to be able to talk. <laughs> <laughs> that when I I heard that there are more similarities between Afghan and Finnish than between French and France and uh, and Finland in the, in the language. It's a uh, it's really out of nowhere. There are some common things with Hungarian, uh, also mm -hmm. from Basque uh, region, oh. and uh, Mongolia, Mongolia, right? and 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 uh, and Estonia. They have right. a lot with Estonia, but um, well, she could she could talk about that much better than me. But yeah, it's uh, totally out of of um, the European map for languages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many people think that you know the Swedes, uh, the the Swedish people, and all the Norwegian they can easily communicate together. No, it's another another yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah, and this Indo-European language family, um, 
I, I mean, I know this now, but I didn't used to realize. So Persian, the language is spoken um, in Iran, that is part of the same language okay. family. And in India, yes, because San ancient Sanskrit and languages that came from that are also related. So it's not just most European languages, it's these other languages as well. So it's a very, very huge language yeah. family. It's quite interesting. And Finnish, not part of it at all. <laughs> no, no connection. Yeah. Anyway, what? I, I'm always fascinated with languages. So the fact that you were able to, to do that is, is very cool. You learned cool. Icelandic, right? I studied Icelandic. I didn't learn. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, but yeah. that must be something too. But it is Indo-European, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, so it's not completely weird. Let's go back to Brittany because you mentioned in passing your teacher Anne Marie de Bois. De Bois Gisson. Is that yeah. how you say her name? Bois Gisson. Okay. Yeah, she was. Um, she arrived right at the right uh, at the at the good moment. Um, I was basically having a career in uh in, in windsurfing at that time i was so much into it you know uh 15 16 17 uh, the teenager playing the violin is not always the most glamorous thing uh it's not always a shame of that it's really not that but you know i had to so much energy to to put that I, i've been i've been underwater every every single time i could and um all my friends are from the same sport as well we were all in school together we we're all following the wind outside at school by the window knowing that okay it's going there is a storm coming let's get ready after school to go there and um and all year round because it's not that cold in Brittany, it can it can get low but um but but still and um that's not really a sport that's compatible with violin for every single reason. Uh, first of all, the cold, um, the cold water. Uh, I, I had my lesson. Uh, I remember that year when she arrived on the, on the Wednesday afternoon. And before that, I used to go on the water mm -hmm. and come back. And I spent hours on my windsurf with the we call that a wishbone, this uh, the thing you're holding. Mm -hmm. And the grip you have on it, when you stay like that in the cold, basically after that, when you take your hands away and you go back home, your hands are still <laughs> that shape. And doing that, it's it's a challenge. And I had my lesson after that. So she she's put things right away in order, saying that, okay, never come back in, in your lesson uh, in this condition. And um, yeah, so I I realized she, you know, she want wanted to me to do things seriously, and uh, of course she had to, and I had to. So I little by little started to reorganize myself and uh, and think, okay, that's right. I've been playing the violin for since I'm four, and uh, uh, what do I do now? Do is it better to quit? <laughs> Is it better to think ahead and have a plan? And um, and that was actually her point. Okay, if you want to do this, do it seriously. Or just quit. It's, mm -hmm. There is no shame to do that. And I just realized, okay, but it's... No, I, I actually love what I'm doing. I love the violin. I love music. And uh, it would be too bad. And so for two, three years, yeah, 15, 16, 17 until I got this famous gold medal. Uh, she she really trained me and she, w I usually saw her once a week and then she, she changed and she would, she would randomly come or I would, I would go in Paris and, and take lessons. And she was very hard with me, very hard. Uh, she would even humiliate me in front of her colleagues sometimes like saying like, you know, this guy, okay, play your, play your concerto or play, play your thing. And, uh, I was not ready enough, and uh, and that sounded terrible. I felt, I felt terrible, and I, I, I really hated her for a while. And then I realized, realized, and she told me that, uh, why do you think I put all this energy, uh, doing that for you? Do you, do you think it's 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 free for me to to be mean with you? And so no, clearly not. So I. 
I realized she was, uh, well, she was basically a second mom for, for three years. Um, and uh, it was easy to fool my parents in a way because they're not musicians. And, you know, they, they, they knew it was uh, hard work to practice. Uh, of course, they knew. But the end result is it's not the same as your own teacher. And um, and then I, 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 I practiced like hell for three years and uh, went back to what uh, what I used to do before actually and uh, and got this uh, this graduation um, and uh, yeah she passed away a few years ago actually just when I got the the job at the NAC okay so did she know about that no she she knew I was playing uh, as a substitute uh, and uh, she knew she was. Uh, I remember she talked about Zuckerman recordings at the time. I was I was uh, mm-hmm. her student, and uh, and when I told her that I was serving with that orchestra uh, conducted by Pinker Zuckerman, she was super happy for me. And no, I I, I got the the job, and uh, and she just passed away. Yeah. Mm. I'm, when you said you went back to what you were doing before, you mean because you were practicing more before you got serious Yeah. Thing? No, no, clearly. Okay. Uh, my mom was behind and uh, I had to, you know, before school, after school, like we all all did. Uh, but no, for, <clears throat> I think at 14, 15, I, I lost track. And um, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how is Anne-Marie different than the teachers you had when you were younger, like in, in, in lessons and the way she approached them? Uh, I think she understood very well uh, and rapidly that being uh, hard with me was actually the good way to make, to have a reaction. Um, it, it, sounds, it sounds bad. Uh, it's usually how teachers are in France, actually, very often, uh, you know, not punishing you, but uh, not really uh, saying what's what you're doing well, and putting mm-hmm. the accent on what's not working. Of course, you have to do that too. But uh, it's you. I had a discussion with Yoske uh, a few few weeks ago about um, education. We we're talking about uh, our children and. Uh, and I said what I what I really appreciate in uh, in North America. I can't I can't uh, generalize for. I just talk about my own experience. But from what I see, uh, and that was the same in Finland, the teachers are accompanying you and uh, giving you the confidence to to work for yourself and not for the mm-hmm. teacher. Which to me, it's yeah. a huge difference. A huge difference, and I think Anne Marie understood it in a in a way that uh, by saying, "Okay, just quit if you don't want to do it. It's fine. It won't ch- change my life. Uh, it will change your life, but that's your decision. But if you want to do it, do it seriously." So I started to, you know, we think about, "Okay, that's she, she's right. Uh, I'm going in one direction. Do I want to?" To play the violin, do I want to put all this energy on uh, on this? And yes, I want it. So I started working for myself, and um, yeah, I think that's what changed. I was starting to be an adult for the first time, um, planning ahead for me, not for her, because I knew she would go back to Paris and have her life. Yeah. Hi, just a quick break from the episode. I'm an independent podcaster who does all the many jobs required to produce this series, and there are a lot of costs I bear as well. Please consider either buying me a virtual coffee as a tip or becoming a monthly supporter starting at $3 Canadian, which is close to $2 US or 2 euros, and getting access to unique perks. The link is in the description. Now back to the episode. Were there any fellow students in the conservatoire who did end up going into law or just doing something yeah, completely different? Yeah, with her. Who... She did. Okay. <laughs> Actually, that was... Uh, people hated her. And I, I hated her too for a while. And uh, many people quit 
and she was known to be the the teacher you don't want to have and um yeah yeah she traumatized some quite many people and um yeah it worked with me but it could be i get it devastating for for some people and it was but it was actually at that age it's a crucial moment where you have to take a decision and uh, it's um yeah, uh, uh, in Montreal, for example, when I when I got there, and same in Finland, many people would go to music, uh, thinking that okay, I have no idea what I want to do in life. Uh, why not trying that? Which is which is great because in Finland they have uh, the structure and they have the financial aspect of it because there there are grants for everyone, so you can try. And which is really a great thing. But by trying, um, I don't think you would take it as seriously as if, you know, your money is counted, your time is counted. You can't really change after that. So it, it I don't think it's the same mindset. Um, and yeah, in, in, in Finland and in, uh, in Montreal, I remember some students coming and not having necessarily the the level to go further but doing it and i think it's a great thing mm-hmm. because you know uh playing music is not necessarily uh, to have a job and of course not but at that age uh 15 16 17 well you, we all have to take a decision right uh it's my parents were were concerned about, uh, of course, what I would do later, and uh, is it going to be? Uh, am I going to be a troubadour all my life, <laughs> or no, no? So uh, there, there is an aspect I'm I'm still thinking about. Of course, there are some positive things in the education in France, and there are some bad things, and same in other systems, but. Uh, Probably something in the middle would be a, a perfect match. Yeah. How how about your non musical education, like your secondary school, talking to your partner and, and her experience in Finland? How is that different? Yeah. Uh Annie went to uh like like you can do in, in Canada. Uh, uh she went to a school where she had a music concentration, art concentration. Uh I think starting very young, uh, we should ask her, but I think 12, 13. So the the schedule is uh, arranged in that way. So you can combine the basic school system with some arts. And um, you have it in France too, but it's a concentration that's very rare and uh, it's uh, it's located in just few cities. Uh, and you, you're young at that age. Do you want to move away from your parents to study that? No. Maybe it changed. I don't know. Um, but at that time, I was doing the you know normal school. I remember I had a, 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 a great teacher, to Jean-Christophe Spinozzi, who actually conducted Violon du Roi last year, I think, or two years ago. Um, and uh, he proposed my parents to go to uh, to Paris to study when I was much younger. And, and not following this, the, the general school system. And my parents said no, because it's, uh, it's, 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 it's there is a big, big risk. If you, if you do that, you miss the, you know, general education in a way. Uh, yeah, so no, <clears throat> I went to normal school. Okay. Mm. I, I was aware that like in Finland, uh, teachers have a high, I think they all have to have master's degrees they're they're yeah. paid a lot more than other countries so their education systems yeah, considered right. much better yeah. right there is much better value for teachers than uh, than in France yeah we hear strikes all the time in France for, mm-hmm. for many different um, works but uh, yeah education system is um, is lacking a lot of of people there I know they are hiring right now because of, it's the same in Quebec actually um, of course, retired people, and but but also people from um, other fields, just to fill the holes. Yeah, no, no, no. The education system in Finland is known to be 
really uh, modern and uh, and great. And uh, I've been to Anisco mm -hmm. in the French classes a few times uh, to talk about France uh, at that time. And um, and she didn't graduate yet in high school. And uh, and yeah, it's it's much different. But I. <laughs> It's it's funny because I think with the cultural aspect also of um, the differences between France and Finland, if you put that system in France right now, I don't think it would work <laughs> because uh, we're not as disciplined because we've been always uh, trained to follow uh, you know that that kind of uh, system where. You work for the teacher. The teacher will punish you if you don't do that. So there is a relation that's... Mm. Um, it, it just wants you as a student to, uh, you know, to play the fool or to, to go forward, uh, to push the limit all the time. And uh, they, they also, in Finland, as I said, they, they work for themselves. So they know there is actually no reason to blame the teacher or yeah the the class was very interesting there were it was a normal class with the same amount of people but uh everyone could talk uh, when they want uh, but there was this courtesy of uh, that you you wouldn't find in, in a class in france at that age clearly not yeah hmm. and they the way the state supports pe young people, they give them quite a lot of financial yeah. support, right? When they graduate high I school. I got a grant from Finland when I went there. I was a foreigner. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, it paid my, uh, well, basically it's free. School is free. Uh, uh, and, and plus that you get, you get a grant for helping you to, to leave. Um, no, it's a, uh, it's a wonderful system that that must cost a lot, of course. But uh, putting the money in education, I think they got it. They got it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's um, talk about your mom, because you were saying she support. She did really help you with your discipline when you were younger and support your, the fact that yeah. you were playing violin. Uh, um, she was the one who introduced me to music when I was four. Uh, I think she understood clearly that music could um, could be, you know, bring bring a child uh, many, many, many things that uh, that could complete other, I don't know how to explain that, but uh, well, she basically understood that art was very important in life and it's never too early to be introduced to art. And uh, so I started the piano first. Um, and then I don't remember that, but uh, my mom said that at the piano lesson, uh, the teacher um, had a, a violin on the wall above the piano. And I said, ah, oh, uh, what's that? And, uh, and then she took it and, uh, and I started, you know, doing a mess with that and uh, and then the teacher said to my mom that uh, it seems that he's kind of interested into that an instrument and um, maybe maybe he could try that so and I was not interested in the piano obviously so I, I started doing this small instrument um, and uh, and she she continuously during all these years um, followed me every day uh, she learned the violin at the same time as me of course like all the parents you know you have to okay. if you're from a non uh, musician's family uh, and uh, you you're interested in what your child is uh, learning you have to in a way understand what what the child is doing no i mean in the basics not every parent will do that i mean in the suzuki method okay. that's expected okay okay well but, in uh, that in that case she was she was very interested into it so she would uh, just to when i was practicing something she would she thought that it would be important to know what i was doing so she could help me and uh, mm -hmm. and she did until a certain level of course 
and uh, and then my my grandparents from my mother's side uh, they were a lot into music as you know listeners. Uh, my grand grandfather was passionate by by music. He would bring me to concerts uh, when I was so young. <laughs> I remember it was terrible. I, I, he he brought me to a concert of uh, Paul Tortorier, the cellist, and uh, I don't know how old I was, but I had this shorts made of uh, flannel, so it's uh, it's kind of wool, and uh, it was scratching me all the concert and I just thought about that please put me outside of this it's 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 terrible <laughs> and when I know that I was assisting at that concert and I was just thinking about my shorts scratching me it's <laughs> I want I want to go back there and, and change it but uh, yeah I went to see Jan-Sophie Mutter I, he brought me to Paris to see concerts as well he was in the car he was constant constantly listening to uh, Beethoven's Quartet uh so that that brought me also uh, into this world a lot, coming from a non musician family. My my dad is an entrepreneur selling uh, industrial paint, and uh, he was the one to com- to convince at some point uh, when it started to be serious enough to okay maybe I'm going to study that later. Mm. Didn't like it first, but but then he encouraged me a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, my mom until until she passed away, she was constantly following and uh, super interested into that. My dad too, of course, but but um, with that aspect of a mom following <clears throat> her child from the beginning to where he's right now, and uh, they were implicated. And unfortunately, she passed away uh, almost two years ago. And uh, the last time I saw her was in Paris when we played uh, the concert in uh, um, Ile de la Cité. So, uh, of course, because of the pandemic, I I, I didn't see her for, for a while. We had to stay here and uh, it was almost three years, which was the first time in my life because I, I used to go every summer to visit my family or, or, she, or they would come. But I'm happy that the last time I saw her, it was at the concert. Yeah, and she got to see. Um, I don't know if you were there after the concert. We went to the, the restaurant, and uh, and she got to see a lot of our colleagues as well. And uh, I was happy for that. Yeah, very happy. Yeah, it was such a shock uh, that she died in an accident, and you had to travel yeah really difficult rules. yeah it, this happened uh two weeks after i got my daughter uh yeah oh yeah it's it was a roller coaster water coaster of emotions where you have this most beautiful um thing in your in your arms and uh, and then you hear about that and also uh it's it's very interest interesting that uh the last time i talked to her uh, which was actually a few minutes before she died. Yeah, on video, oh my goodness. Uh, we talked about, uh, we just got the house. Uh, I mean, we were about to get it. We didn't have it, but we had plans. We had view on this house. And, uh, and we bought this house because it was uh, big enough to have our, our parents, Annie and my parents, uh, to visit and, and stay, you know, longer than when you live in a small flat in a downtown and uh and she was so excited and uh and then i, I just told her that oh i have to send you a video i was dancing with salmi uh on the dance of the flowers you know in the nutcracker and uh and she, and and salmi was of course she was less than two weeks almost two weeks and um and uh, but I remember she was smiling all the time while I was doing that. So I said to my mom, "I send you that. You will you will like it." And uh, I sent the video, and we are like that. You know, you can see if someone watched it or saw it. And no, she never. So, but but you know, the last talk we had was about all these uh, very positive things coming up. So, yeah. 
And it, it's her mother um, that you call. My grandma, day. yeah. Yeah. Mamushka. We call yeah. her <laughs> with that name. Grandpapa and Mamushka. So my granddad uh, passed away three years ago, and my, uh, my grandmother is still alive. She's uh, 92. Very in good uh, physical shape. Of course, she she was devastated, and she is still devastated by my mom' um, accident. And uh, but but we talk every day. Yeah, we send pictures. We we call every day. Uh, I think she she is keeping it together uh, by keeping this uh, close relation. It's not just with me, it's m with my brothers too. She's, she's talking every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so she's uh, yeah. taking the lead now a little bit. And uh, it's great. It's great. I saw that video you had shared with uh, your grandmother where she spoke about the values of bringing up children with nature and instead of toys oh, okay you saw sticks, that and it was yeah. really beautiful Showed... yeah it's it's for christmas yeah. she because that she was interviewed in um in the in le monde the, that big uh, newspaper in france um it was an article uh, interviewing interviewing uh i think nine uh people who were more than 90 and having a kind of nice life and uh, still doing a lot of things and she was one of them. So she, at Christmas, I, I received a package with uh, the the real paper, the interview and the pictures. And uh, and uh, she's so modern. She's so modern. Um, she she's first of all very agile with uh, internet. She she knows you know she knows almost as many things as, as I do on uh, on internet. She, all the smileys, you know them super well, and uh, how to send pictures, files, and uh, so that's the first thing. And also, you wouldn't say she's ninety-two. <laughs> Honestly, it's it's really incredible, really incredible. And um, okay. yeah, yeah. I hope she, I hope you meet her. I, I'm trying my that's best it. to bring her here, but uh, and she she'd love to. That it's just the uh, complicated at that age i think yeah i should go and yeah. maybe travel with her but uh, but because my mom never never uh never came here uh, actually, even in ottawa mm -hmm. uh because of the pandemic and because of you know life uh she 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 would love to to come not for her but to to see Let's see. Let's see. Maybe, maybe I could manage to bring her. I really hope. Yeah. Yeah. So now that you're a dad, what do you think in terms of balancing, you know, your life as a musician and the way you're bringing up your child? I mean, she's still very young, but in terms of the way you're well, it's a it's clearly a life changer. Um, the time. I think the time is uh, the key. Uh, you know, many times I heard before we had a child that uh, enjoy all the free time you have because it will <laughs> never be the same. Uh, for the best, of course, for the best. But uh, I, yeah, the, I, I, I always heard that. But I think you have to experience it to <laughs> really realize it. So yeah, I had to organize everything differently. Um, take every minute I have to to be efficient in in my practice. Uh, I have to say it's it's easier now, a little bit. Uh, but yeah, last year it was a mess. It was such a mess, especially with COVID. Uh, daycare being closed, you know, every second week. And uh, uh, but no, uh, talking about Salme, it's her name. I think. She arrived at the right moment because just before my my mom died, she it's a life for another in a way, and she she she's bringing she's um, elle remplit ce vide. Je sais pas comment she's dit filling ça. that hole that that void. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and uh, it's just pure joy, and I can't conceive life now 
without that it's uh it's the most beautiful thing that could ever happen to me and Annie. Um, I know it's not for everyone, but uh, no, no, it's. Uh, <laughs> I can't describe it. It's every morning I wake up and I'm just like, am I dreaming? Do we really have this beautiful thing that's bringing uh, love and uh, and uh, sunshine in our life every day? Yeah. And she's trilingual. She's almost <laughs> almost four languages because we realized after a while that they have this um, this uh, sign language at uh, okay. the daycare. Yeah, she had to go in a daycare. We, we were lucky enough to find one because it was difficult, and it's an uh, English speaking daycare, um, which is which is all fine. Uh, so she's most probably speaking English more. I mean hearing English more than than at home because you spend your day at the daycare it's 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 quite long uh, the Finnish with Annie uh, the French with me and then she has it's 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 a mess in her head it's starting to come now during vacation time it's um it's going much faster but she would she would say for example papa more so she has these three languages for I mean, two for more with, with this science. And she, mm -hmm. she would come up at home with some new science we don't understand. So we're searching like she would do that. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> help, help. I know, I know. I'll do that. And um, that's play. And uh, yeah, she, she, she manages to surf with all these different languages. Uh, it's, it's very funny. It's very funny. It can be fr super frustrating for her because, of course, she's willing to communicate. And uh, and we're like, it's it's like playing a game, you know, the, the, with this game where you have to to find what the person is miming or and uh, but something. She was like, <laughs> why don't you understand me? Yeah. I, I took anthropology at McGill a couple courses. My sister's an anthropologist, so I was influenced. And I remember a prof talking about, he'd done research about circus uh, families, that these children might be able to speak seven languages and they would mix up the vocabulary, but they okay. would have the grammar and syntax very clear because yeah. we seem, we're, we're wired when we learn that very young. Word order and all that, which I always found fascinating. So, you know, I learned some sign language um, when we adopted our second child from China because I knew that she wouldn't know English and she was at the age to be speaking. So I had learned some signs and that the first communication we had with her was through ASL. And then okay. when she started to speak, it was with the signs she knew. And then we returned to that during the pandemic. Okay. Studying ASL now for fun. Yeah. Which is really, it's a beautiful language. I mean, there's many different sign languages yeah. all over the world. But that's yeah, it's it's that, it's uh, funny funny. actually because I, I got a book from the library <clears throat> a few weeks ago about uh, sign languages, and uh, I was studying it hardly and going to Salmi and saying, you know, any any signs like, and and she would look at me like, what what's that? And I realized that's signs from from France, and they are different. So right. anyway. Yeah, but 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 you're right about the probably it's it's yeah. a mess when it has to come out of her mouth because she she picks basically what what she can say. But I realized that uh, because I always mm -hmm. pick French to her, we decided and we heard that it's for the best to that we keep our language for many different reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, but one day I remember uh, I'm reading her story every night uh, in French and. Uh, one day she wanted that book in the pile um, and I took it and it was in Finnish and I started speaking Finnish and she looked at me. It's terrible. <laughs> and uh, no, no, but she, she really understand that uh, it's not, it's not appropriate to me. So, no. That's really cool. So how, what was it like for you, mm -hmm. the change, if we can go back to orchestra, you know, when you're um, subbing, so you were um, playing in Montreal, doing all kinds of different gigs, and then you would come in maybe at the last minute and high yeah. pressure, you know, uh, try to make impression. Yeah, that was, that was a, a tough and very uh, instructing, on peut dire ça? Instructive. 
yeah, instructive mm -hmm. uh, a job yeah. to do. Uh, very stressful, you're right. <laughs> very stressful. I remember at that time that was Ryan uh, who was taking Mako's uh, position while she was away for her pregnancy. And uh, it was after Christmas vacation. My dad was here. We were in a cottage and uh, I got a phone call the day before, after the vacation time. It was 10 p.m. and it was for coming in, in Ottawa the day after and it was Bruckner. Oh, uh, no, 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 it was Nielsen Symphony. And oh. uh, and I Oof. really was about to say, no, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And uh, and I don't know, I said yes. I don't know why. And I spent my night not sleeping, just looking at the score with the music. I couldn't play. It was at night. and uh, um, But I, yeah, so at least I knew the music with the score. But no, it was so stressful, so stressful. And of course, having the position makes a, a big difference. But as a sub, if you're playing, you know, I was having my gigs in Montreal, especially with Collective Neuf or other ensembles. Um, there is a dif different tempo all the time. And that's, uh, if you're used to that, because mm -hmm. you've been doing that all your life, it's, it's, all, it's also very, um, very rich. I, when I was in Montreal as well, I, I used to, uh, to, to work for Olivier Perrault, the violin maker, uh, to help him find new instruments mm -hmm. or help some customers. So I got to play many different violins and I loved it. He would also do some tuning, some uh, fine tunings on instruments and, uh, uh, I was here to play and say, okay, uh, that's helping that way. So I would experiment <clears throat> with other things. And I was mm -hmm. uh, fascinated by that aspect. So all these different kind of um, works, uh, I think if you have the chance to, uh, to survive with that, because you're waiting for the phone calls, basically, and I was lucky enough to have them, but uh, but it's super stressful. You you have this, uh, of course, that aspect of being ready, 24 hours later for a concert is one thing, but the the financial aspect is another one. Uh, you can't predict things in advance. You can't, uh, yeah. Of course, the last years before I went to uh, Naco were much easier because there were things settled. It's, you know, you're always playing with the same ensembles, and they call you all the time. You know. But uh, when I arrived in Montreal, I didn't know any people. Uh, of course, I was a student, but you have to you have to get some money, and um, little by little, it's it's coming. But yeah, and and then starting with the orchestra, it's another tempo, where in a normal season before COVID, and uh, it's probably getting there again. Uh, it's it's also never stopping. You have to keep it. Uh, together yeah our co our colleague uh, Joanna our principal flutist she sent to me many years ago which I, I love that it's true image for me we always have a conveyor belt of music yeah. conveyor belt like oh, in a yeah, store yeah. where it's rolling you know you yeah. Put your, yeah exactly that's what it feels like right yeah it goes by yeah. and then it's gone yeah, so and then it's it the was next a very thing. different way also of uh practicing because of course as a sub you have to learn super fast the music and uh put things together nobody knows that you've been called 24 hours before yeah. so i have so much compassion for subs so much yeah and uh but but uh the the way I used to, especially with Collective Net, for example, where we had a, um, a show put together uh, that we would record, that we would uh, tour with, it's a different kind of practicing. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, practicing a concerto. You have you have time. It's of course it's hard music, but it's uh, it's different. It's much different, and you get to know every single part of what who's playing what and. Uh, there is no conductor. You, you ha It's not the same. It's very chamber. So it's not the same. I, I don't say I don't do that with the orchestra. It's, it's not necessarily having the time to do it all the time. And uh, when I started playing with Nako, 
I didn't have that much symphonic experience. Uh, I, of course, I, I've been serving with orchestras, but you know, when you, when you say this conveyor thing uh, yeah. and you play this Brahms symphony, uh, I don't know when when Eddie or Cowley says, "I've been playing 600 times <laughs> Nutcracker," <laughs> and that's the first time for you uh, with one rehearsal. Of course, yeah. when you played it three, four years, it it seems almost easy but uh but the first year yeah yeah so also a lot of compassion for subs and for the new members yeah and what's it like being on the other side of the audition screen oh um i i have to say i liked it and didn't like it in a way uh, i liked it because uh of course you you have the chance to choose for a new colleague and it's very exciting um, also a lot of responsibility in the decision uh, we not always all agree and uh, you have to defend uh, what you think and also the stress uh, that because my audition was five six years ago it's still super fresh. When when we started okay. the audition, I I could feel the the pressure, and I'm sure I'm sure you do too, right? It's you know it's it's a lot of pressure for for every every participant, and uh, yeah, so a lot of empathy for that. Um, but no, it's it's very interesting because you you you've been there before, personally, and and then you hear what people are doing in the same process. And uh, yeah, it's very interesting. In Europe, are they using screens the same way? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure if it's uh, at the final. Mm. I'm not sure. But yeah, before yeah. that, yes. So with, I think, almost every orchestral player I've uh, interviewed on the series, we have discussed screens, but some listeners may have missed the, those discussions. So just to briefly say, in order to have more diversity mm. and equity, in the last generation or so orchestras we use a screen so we do not see who's coming we don't see you know we have no idea of their yeah. experience or education or anything we just go based on what we hear no definitely and it's uh i don't see how a process could be more fair than that of course you can debate on uh, is the best player in an audition the best fit in an orchestra that's another topic but but for the for the screen, the screens and the and the and the process, it's no, it's it's super fair. And we are so many people mm -hmm. also in the jury that uh, coming from different sections. Yeah. That uh, no, it's uh, it gives a lot of equity. Yeah. When I joined the orchestra, there were four people on the committee, and now there's twelve. Really? Okay. Yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a great process. And I, I will, really like their experience for that. Yeah. Do you have advice for people practicing for auditions in terms of the way you approached it? Uh, I think my advice would be, because I heard that so many times, uh, I, I, I will audition for a place. It's what I, I, I heard. <clears throat> I would audition for a place just for um, the experience and training. I don't well in my in my opinion I don't think it's a you know people not so ready but they just want to have the experience uh, it's 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 a stressful situation where you can be a little bit traumatized in a way so I would put all my energy to make it valuable yeah definitely and uh, and yeah, record yourself uh, as much as possible because you are the your fait ton pire ennemi when it comes to you're your worst yeah when it worst critic exactly. Um, I mean, also play for other people, of course, because they're they're good too. Sometimes we forget we can hear the recording and and don't even hear actually anymore what's what's missing. But that that's for sure I, I, I would I would make the audition process um, as seriously as possible preparing for it learning what's what's happening uh, in the excerpt not what you're playing because mm -hmm. you can really hear when people uh, know the context that was very interesting 
I found it very interesting. Sometimes you could hear that, okay, there is something happening here. If you know it, you wouldn't do that. Um, yeah. And um, good luck. Yeah. So have you changed your routine um, in terms of keeping in shape since you have more limited time now? Yeah. Um, I've been starting to put things together, honestly, the last month. Uh, since since things things are a little bit more stable, uh, mm -hmm. last year with uh, you know my mom passing and Salm is arriving, all this COVID uh, mess, I was I was a little bit off off track, and now I I go back to, uh, to you know um, just before that I would I would take every single minute and go and practice as fast as I could what we have to play. Now I would organize differently. Um, mm -hmm. Plan a little bit more ahead of, uh, okay, I choose that uh, passage that's critical and uh, I have a plan for the next days. Mm -hmm. And before yeah. that, it was a little bit more the, the panic. I would just start the beginning and uh, with no plan. And it, it was too stressful. No, but mm -hmm. clearly I have less time. For sure, I like like yeah, like all the parents, of course. And we still we just have one. I can imagine with more. Do you have certain technical things you do? Yeah, I uh, I went back to uh, the Schadix, the the Shevsik, the you know shifting uh, shifting. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember which office this is, but uh, I have this one. I'm I'm practicing. Um, I have this um, Galamian scale as well, but I, I I took the my old flesh uh, scale book back, and uh, I realized that oh my god, it's it's so dense. Mm -hmm. Like when you go, to, <laughs> I, I used to I used that until I came in Finland mm -hmm. actually, and uh, you know you just go through one tonality and it takes you so much time. But uh, it's good. It's good sometimes to go back to that. And I have another one that I'm doing now. It's the Dunis. Mm -hmm. um, this crazy uh, um, tense that you're feeling just to stretch a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's good. It's good. It's good to do that again. It's really good. And uh, during the season, it's hard to keep that routine. It's super hard. I, f I find. Um, now I don't have much time. I found that, you know, why I had the time to do it before and why not last year. Yeah. 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 I've distilled my, my technical routine down to like a very short thing that's kind of works for me. But actually that Shevchik book, I've recently gone back to it because I, I hadn't been teaching that book for many years because I hated it as a kid, but I've been teaching it to some students and I'm having them play them in different keys as you're supposed to, which I didn't do when I was a kid. So now yeah. every day I play a different one in a different key, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. No, I try also to, um, you know, it's easy to, to, to start the Shradiak, for example, and, uh, you put your metronome and you, and you go through the book and, uh, you know, it can take you three hours. I mean, if you want to do all these repeats and, um, but it's of course not a way to, uh, to do it every day, but, um, sectioning it's, it's what I said before. It's, I, I just, now things are getting a little bit more easy. I, and I, I have more fresh head. I can plan more in advance and know, with a little bit less stress that, okay, that's efficient for now and that's tomorrow I will do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you did your doctorate um, at Université de Montréal and you did it on Sibelius Violin Concerto, the original version. So you yep. did some pretty interesting research as part of that. Mm -hmm. It was it was such a, a subject that was coming naturally, of course, because of Finland, um, because this concerto is, to me, one of the greatest one and uh, and because of that very mysterious aspect of the original version that's been hidden almost because the the rights were not um, open mm -hmm. uh, to play there is only chemicals uh, who, who were the only one to uh, to be able to record it because he won the civilis competition mm -hmm. the the most interesting aspect of the research was to be able to see the manuscript in Helsinki 
and see on the paper the differences. And before that, before I got the chance to, to do that, uh, I tried to uh, rewrite uh, the passages by, by ear. Wow. But it, yeah, but it was so difficult. But uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the original version. No. Nope. Um, okay. It's, uh, it's basically the same concerto with 10 more minutes and uh, more complicated, more uh, technically mm -hmm. difficult. And um, there is a new, uh, there is another cadenza also added. Uh, the first small cadenza you have, you know, it's accompanied a little oh. bit, yeah. So it it gives it, you know, this kind of thing uh, is interesting because you you could think that okay maybe it's it's kind of stable. There is the timpani behind it. Mm -hmm. The the way you play the new the new version can by by knowing the the, the first one can help you having a you know taking a decision on your version on your adaptation uh but but so then i got the chance to go to helsinki in the archives and um, i had my white gloves and uh, uh, i opened it and it was such a wonderful experience first of all the 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 manuscript had a lot of drawings um Sibiris was drawing uh, pine trees birds uh, uh, a sunset uh, in some places, some passages. Uh, so you 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 kind of enter his head and the the mindset he had at that time, or he would suddenly uh, take the pen, the pencil, and uh, and scratch all this passage. And uh, trying, I was trying to see what was behind. Uh, couldn't. But so I don't know if I can say that, <laughs> but uh, normally you're not supposed to have anything with you. You have white gloves, mm -hmm. uh, of course, no camera, nothing. But uh, I I, re uh, I wrote the the cadenza uh, back when I went back and forth. I took some small pieces of the cadenza and and was able to have it complete. Um, and. Uh, yeah, my intention was not to open a business with that, so it's uh, it's all fine. But um, no, it's it's a it's a wonderful concerto. I I never got the chance to be able to play it. That was my plan first because I played the Sibelius concerto uh, at my final recital with orchestra, and uh, of course the plan was to play the first one. But authorizations are yeah. closed for. I know when th this will be open again. But it would have been great, yeah. So Sibelius was a viol he studied violin very seriously when yeah. he was young. Yeah. Maybe you could speak to that story for people that aren't familiar. Yeah, with that. he was a violin player and he was, I think, uh, he was having a lot of uh, dreams about violin playing. He wanted to be um, you know, a soloist or a great player. And then his violin career stopped a little bit abruptly. I think he got uh, a comment from uh, someone from Vienna uh, who told him that um, basically you're not, you're not that good. And uh, in, the, in the writing of uh, Sibelius' uh, concerto or violin pieces, you can, you know, he's been dreaming to play that, I'm pretty sure, uh, himself. And... Um, and the, the the funny story also about the the first version of the Sibelius concerto is that when it was first played, it was played um, by someone who screwed up. It didn't sound good. The critic was terrible. Uh, and then it went back again. It, that's why he changed it. Mm -hmm. It was because of the player. It was because of the player, but it, it changed it, made it more simple. Uh, cut a lot of passages and uh you know so i think there is this um, um because there is a big biography of sibelius from uh, i don't remember his name it's a great book if you're interested in his life um, but it's that thick mm -hmm. and uh it it really shows the frustration he had um, of not being able to play what he was writing mm -hmm. you know fascinating composer history. No. Yeah. 
What were your nerves like? Perf- like I've never played a concerto with orchestra. What was that like compared to playing in orchestra, which we get nervous, but in a totally different way, I think. I I, I had the chance to do that before in Finland, actually. Uh, I did a. It was a, a small competition. I mean, a competition at the side of the the region. Um, so I got to play that, and I remember that first time I was um, petrified a little bit. And then I, I got a, a chance to play it again uh, in Montreal before that uh, two or three times. And uh, suddenly this first experience uh, helped me feel feel actually good and realizing that, uh, you know, you're really not playing alone. You're a little bit as an orchestra musician. It's the uh, englobé par, uh, par l'orchestre autour de toi. Mm-hmm. They're, they're supporting you. And uh, no, it's definitely stressful for one aspect, uh, the projection. You feel mm-hmm. like you should give so much. And uh, the first first uh, reaction is like to play to art. Mm-hmm. And uh, no, but I loved it. I really loved it. Especially with this concerto. Wow. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My mom was, was my mom in the concert hall? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but all my friends were there. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it was a great experience because I felt that all the people in the orchestra, because they were my friends too, and in the mm-hmm. audience, because most of them were my friends too, they were here, here just to give a positive energy. So it was very supportive. It's not like you go in a city, you play with an orchestra, you don't know, with an audience, you don't know, and you just have to prove yourself, prove people that they didn't pay Mm -hmm. that much money for nothing. No, it was not the same context. It was not, no. Did you aspire when you were a child to be a soloist as a profession? A little bit until 14, 15. (laughs) You remember that story about 15, 16, 17. Yeah, a little bit. Because I think in the in the French education system, it's 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 going that way all the time, which mm-hmm. is ridiculous. Nobody, I mean, there are just few people who will do that, and mm-hmm. and and uh, it's the the orchestra playing is not um, n'est pas uh, mis en valeur. It's, it's not, valued. not valued. Yeah, valued, uh, which is really ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, so of course, like probably all of my friends at that age were dreaming of playing uh, uh, do that as a career of uh, playing concertos with orchestra but you you were like that of course it's uh, it's not as easy as it looks like and um, yeah one thing that struck me about your story from the beginning about uh, your teacher Anne-Marie was that she was giving you two options either get serious or quit which is really terrible but maybe she's saying it's not worth my while for the type of teaching I do but most music students don't go on to work professionally hopefully they can continue to be music lovers and continue to play I think too many people quit too early because they don't have the third option of you just do it a little bit casually you know because you love music and as a teacher what is your perspective on that yeah and as a parent too yeah right uh no 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 for sure Anne-Marie had a, a way of teaching that was really not conventional. And uh, and I, I said she she was um, devastating for some people because they quit. Um, uh, I think it worked with me just for ch- these two reasons. The, 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 the first is that I started to realize I had to work for myself. And the second one was also to prove her that she was wrong which is mm-hmm. not a good motivation, but in a way it's a motivation uh, because she humiliated me. I told you uh, once playing in front of other teachers just yeah. in the classroom. And I found it so terrible. It's you should really not do that. I would never do that. Uh, but that day I, I know I really wanted her to prove that she, no, you can't do that. You, you won't do that again. Um, as a teacher, I, I, I would encourage uh, everyone to play music or, or some art or something that open your mind and uh, 
But we have to say that also playing uh, an instrument is is a lot of work. If you want to do it seriously, it's a lot of work. So, uh, yeah, there is a, a balance to find. There is a good balance mm -hmm. to find. But don't you don't don't you think that you find also the satisf satisfaction in the playing by, um, you know, pushing a little bit yourself in a, in a way and then managing to achieve. Uh, something you've been dreaming to to play, like playing a piece. It's a it's commitment. It's a, uh, you know we all ask students to to practice every day better to practice every day a little bit a li little bit than playing two days in a row for eight hours. Uh, but it's it's a commitment to do that. But no, I, I would never be like Anne Marie de Beaujolais. No. <laughs> Never. But uh, if someone asked me, and this happened, um, and she we started together, and, and she was full of ambition, full of ambition. She was 16, I think, at that time. And uh, she was not actually having the, the technical skill to, to, to go in that direction. And, uh, but, but she asked me, so do you see me as a professional musician? And I said, I, I, I said honestly, I don't think so. I said you can, you can, you can work hard for that, of course. And I would never say don't go there in a way. But, but if you ask me right now, I don't think it's a, it's realistic. And it, it cost me a lot to say that. But in a way, um, I would have liked someone to tell me that also at some point if this was the case because it's uh you know you have all the energy all the, the financial aspect behind it you have the i don't know what do you think yeah i mean you mentioned financial i think that's huge i think if people have a lot of support from their family that have money yeah. and they can have the luxury you know yeah um of pursuing something that may not lead to earning a living i mean that is part of it that it's kind of the white elephant in the room, right? Yeah. And in some places, like the States, it's ridiculously expensive to um, get an education. So, and instruments, you know, instruments. buying a violin, right. buying a bow, it's, it's very big financial. Yeah. If it wasn't for that, then of course, and there's so diff many different styles of music. If you, as classical players, we have to be able to master all the four octaves of the violin. Mm. For many styles of music, you don't have to. It's you know, it's completely different technique. Yeah. Um, but you're right. I mean, um, the example I, I said about Finland, who has this uh, wonderful system where every student, no matter the subject you're studying, has a grant. It's a free school. There is no pressure. There is no inequalities between, you know, who has parents who can pay for that. Or So, of course, you can try and you can experience it. And that's really amazing. But in a... In a in a country like France or in a country like, I don't know what, uh, well, lucky you if you have rich parents, but otherwise it's, it's going to be complicated. Yeah. And you, it, mm -hmm. especially in France, you don't, uh, I mean, once the wheel has turned, you can't go back. Uh, in, no, I, no, no. I, I, when I was in, uh, in Montreal in the university, I did my master first and then the doctorate, but I, I learned that, okay, I could do another master in, uh, for example, marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's something. Maybe changed in the last two, three years in France, but it's not something that's possible. Uh, you have to go back from the beginning. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you have equivalences between, you know, medicine and biology or that kind of things, mm -hmm. but from music to marketing, mm, I doubt. Really, okay. Especially because music is not in university, right? No, yeah. No, I was going to say about fly fishing because that's a, an aspect that that was the one oh, thing. Okay. And so, yes, I wanted to ask about fly fishing, and also one thing we didn't talk about. Do you have any? I, I'm fascinated with the traditional culture of Brittany, the whole Celtic aspect, yeah. and I was wondering if you knew anyone who spoke the language. Yeah. If that was my grandmother does. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was forbidden at, at her age. Uh, they, at school, they were obliged to speak French. And um, 
but they secretly, of course, continued. We, we had this talk with my grandma a few weeks ago, actually, because of Salmi. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so now there is such a strong um, cultural revival in, uh, in Britain. It's in the, you know, maybe the last 30 years. Um, all these fest news, for example, that's the, um, the traditional uh, dance parties. Uh, they are everywhere now, and it's it's kind of mm -hmm. cool as a young person to go there. And um, it used to be different, different, but but now it's very cool. I, I remember I've been many times. Um, <clears throat> there there are a lot of <clears throat> I'm sorry, a lot of similarities with um, Quebec mu music, traditional, of course, because of all the woods between the two. Um, I'm not a specialist on, on, on that music, but uh, yeah, you by listening to, to some Quebec music, I, I I was sometimes pretty sure it was from Brittany, and it was not. Mm. Yeah. So people might be interested to realize that Great Britain, La Grande Bretagne, is because it was people like the the people in Brittany came from the UK yep. and they left when the Anglo-Saxons invaded mm -hmm. so long ago. So it's Celtic people. So this is many thousands of years old civilization and this language that it's really pretty far from France. From oh, France. yeah. So, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not speaking it. I know a few words, but uh, yeah. you, we, we all know words in Brittany because uh, a lot of um, ge geographical places are named in Britain, like, mm -hmm. for example, Penarbed means the end of the earth, uh, which is a place uh, Britain is, is pointing towards the ocean. And uh, yeah, it's the end of the end of earth. Uh, I know quite many words, but just because of that, just because of that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, a, yeah, the Celtic aspect makes it very unique in France. Did you, did you learn traditional songs in school? Or... Yeah, they are. I um, uh, it's funny. I I, I found a book. Uh, actually, no, my dad found a book for Salmi. Uh, it's a song book where, where you can listen to the music at the same time. It's traditional uh, songs from Brittany. And uh, yeah, I, I knew them. I knew them. Okay. Yeah. I knew them. Just uh, basic ones. So let's close out this conversation with uh, fly fishing. It was one of your passions. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, I think it's there. All these outdoors activities are related uh, to the same meaning. Um, it could be fly fishing. It could be mushroom picking. It could be windsurfing. It could be, you know, hiking. Uh, actually, they are all an excuse to get outside first. Um, and you know, I love. Uh, sail with some friends i'd love to fly fish with some friends or go mushroom picking with some friends but i have to say alone it's actually uh, what what motivates me the most i'm uh, i love being there for you know wh when i'm the most stressed i just think about this moment where i arrive very early in the morning i just enter the river and be just in the middle in the stream and uh, and just listen to what's around me and okay i don't think there are better places in on earth when you need to resource um this is this is yeah i think fly fishing is mostly an excuse to to spend that time egoistically there of course i love the i love fishing and I love making flies. I love all this aspect, but, uh, yeah, if I take it, if I take some fish, it's great. If I, if I don't, it's, it's not a problem just, just because of that. So the, the flies is like you're imitating insects landing. So it's different than. Bait yeah. Fishing. It's, uh, you landing or, or under the surface also in different stages. Mm -hmm. And that's what's okay. very interesting also. Um, well, I, I won't go too deep into that, but um, well, basically, you have to understand your environment. You are there, 
as uh, as an observer first because um, you have to understand what type of insects are in in in, in that uh, ecosystem right there at what time of the year they are different depending on the, on the time of the year and then you have to replicate them as close as possible from the original version so it's it's very interesting because it's super uh, complex but complete um, and you feel by by implicating yourself into this uh, this world that you're part of it because you understand what's what's surrounding you you understand that some birds well i'm not i'm not so much into that but basically there are some birds eating this they they're all all these insects are actually the root of this system and i replicate them i try to and uh, and then that satisfac- satisfaction of catching a fish with with what you started from nothing it's really great i don't eat fish so you know it's uh, if I really wanted to get some fishes, I could throw a net in the river. It's forbidden, of course, but but the the intention is to to understand the process and 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 start from from this understanding to the final uh, insect that you created, the right one that the trout is eating, because she, she, the the trout is selecting at that moment of the day which of these dozens of insects are there. So you have to find it. So are you releasing them or or does Annie eat the fish? I will eat them. Uh, well, I, oh, okay. I keep some if someone wants to eat one. Uh, but no, I won't I won't kill one for for nothing, of course not. Yeah. And and for for people who are worried about that I, I use uh, Oaks with no barbs, so it's uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And they're very tiny. Did you grow up eating fish by the shore? It seems weird you don't eat fish. Yeah, uh, my my grandparents from my uh, father's side were um, had a, a shop of selling uh, fishing equipment. Uh, they've been fishing also all their life. My dad too. I don't know why I don't uh, eat fish. Maybe I've been traumatized uh, by eating so, so much fish when I was younger. No, it's really not my my cup of tea. No. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but but uh, the aspect also uh, that I like in the in the, in uh, fly fishing and especially in the in the uh, flying ties is that you make a product that's finished. And once it's done, you put it in the box. And when you wake up the day after, it's still in the box and it's still the same fly. Compared to music where you practice all day and you wake up the day after, and sometimes it's not the product you've put in the, in the violin case before. And I think we all have this. Uh, I, I've been talking with a lot of musicians who had the same feeling. Like, you know, some people, they like to uh, create furniture or they... They like to do something concrete just because it's it's so satisfying to uh, yeah to and reassuring to have this small thing you put there and you know it will always be the same yeah I relate and in fact I was talking to a fellow um, sourdough baker in the orchestra who said you have a beginning a middle and an end and that's how I feel about yeah. my bread too yeah right you do that yeah yeah. Well, thanks, Fred. This Thank you, Leah. Great. Thank you very much. I'll yeah. see you in a few days. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thanks for following the series on your favorite podcast player and sharing your favorite episodes with your friends, all of which help find new listeners. I have lots more episodes coming in this season three with a fascinating diversity of musicians and their stories and music. Please consider either buying me a virtual coffee as a tip or becoming a monthly supporter, the link is in the description. Have a great week.